Hello everyone and welcome to the back room. This time I have something of a rarity, a £1 VHS videotape sized XT compatible known as the Pocket PC. It was made by the Pocket Computer Corporation of Sunnyvale, California and launched in early 1990. This company was founded by ex-Texas Instruments engineer John Fairbanks along with TI colleague Stan Prodromo and Rob Wilt, former chairman of ICL in the UK. The machine is built around a CMOS 8088 and runs DOS 3.3. The non-backlit display is CGA compatible. It's powered by two AA batteries and they have a claimed life of 100 hours. I bought mine secondhand in 1998 for £25. It came with a very nicely produced ring bound manual describing the operation of the machine and its built in software. Notice that mine has a keyboard intended for a market other than the UK. In fact, it has an Italian keyboard and many of the keys have letters and symbols not used on an English example. Fortunately, a previous owner has taken the trouble to put tiny stickers over many of the keys with the correct English legends on them. And though you might imagine these wouldn't be terribly effective, they're still in place 25 years since I acquired it and possibly for many years before that. Despite being tiny, the keyboard is a joy to use with sculpted keycaps that fall comfortably, well, to my fingers anyway, and depress in a satisfyingly positive way. You can elect to have the machine confirm key presses with an audible key click, but that is simply to waste the battery in my opinion. Here I'm making several attempts at resetting and booting the machine but to no avail. As you can see the pocket would only show a series of thin black stripes on screen before shutting off. A well known and common fault. There was nothing for it but to attempt to split the case, reveal the motherboard and make some attempt at locating the fault. If you're at all familiar with the machine, you'll know there are three things about it which every owner wants to know. How to build a serial adapter to transfer software to the computer. How to strip it when it goes wrong. And how to fix the most common fault, which is a computer which boots to thin black lines. The first of these is easy, and I'll show you how I built my serial adapter soon after acquiring the computer. The second is difficult but manageable, though potentially destructive, and therefore not to be undertaken lightly. As for the third, well, watch on. If you Google the pocket, there's very little usable or accurate information. You'll likely encounter posts suggesting that getting to the motherboard is a simple matter of locating and undoing the screws hidden under the rubber feet, one at each corner. Uh, no. In fact, the computer is sonically welded and to open it, you must be prepared to break the welds. It's a tricky job with plenty of potential for catastrophe. However, if like mine, your pocket is exhibiting the booting to black lines fault, then there may be nothing else for it. I found that whereas the tool of choice when prying apart plastic components would ordinarily be a spodger so as not to leave marks or gouges, in this case the only tool which will exert sufficient force is a small screwdriver. Handled carefully however it should be possible to avoid marking the case. Insert the blade between the lip of the lower case and the edge of the keyboard and start to pry it apart until you feel a distinct crack. 
Then work the blade around the case until you've broken all the welds. As you begin to pry the case apart and lift out the keyboard together with the motherboard, the welds will appear as raised bumps around the edge of the keyboard. With the welds broken, remove the plastic cover from the power supply at the rear of the keyboard and then you can gently twist and pull it from the case sufficiently such that you can turn it over and examine the motherboard. Pay particular attention to the coiled ribbon cable between the computer and its screen. This is delicate and there is no way to open the screen to replace it that would not result in its destruction. When you've revealed the motherboard, you can begin to identify the various components of which the pocket has remarkably few. In this view, the power supply components are top left. 10 Fujitsu 84256 32x8 bit CMOS memory chips and 3 Sony 58100 132x8 bit CMOS memory chips line the lower edge of the motherboard and account for the 640K of memory. Two of the Fujitsu chips are used for parity. This machine is what's generally known as the Pocket Prime, sporting a larger memory and it has several BIOS improvements over the 512K Pocket Classic. Each of the three black blobs at the centre of the board is known as a cob or chip on board. Each is a microchip minus its dip package soldered directly to the board and then covered with a blob of molten plastic. I believe the larger of these cobs, the left in the picture, is the 8088 CPU. The cobs make fault tracing exceedingly difficult. You can't remove the plastic blob without destroying the chip within. There's no way to determine orientation and the only way to view signals is to scope the tiny traces and wires to and from the cobs and try to figure out what it is you're seeing. I decided to begin my exploration by inserting a couple of known good batteries, checking voltage was getting from the battery contacts and then checking for 5 volts at the memory chips. I tried a final couple of reset power cycles to see if anything had changed in the process of removing the board from the case. The reset button is accessed with the tip of a pencil or some such and lies in a recess just below the scroll lock key. To reset the machine, press and hold the reset button for a few moments, release then press the on off switch, at which point the machine should initiate a cold boot. With nothing happening other than black lines despite power getting to the board, it was time to get an oscilloscope and have a closer look. Here I am, moments later, looking at directory entries and accessing Pocket Tools, the built-in software from the menu button. Please forgive the glare in this sequence, I tried to shine an overhead lamp onto the screen to make it more visible to the camera, but actually only made it worse. Scrolling through the tools, there's a calculator with a frankly off user interface, a mini word processor intended for simple note taking, an address book, a personal calculator, a usable little terminal and so on.
Maybe I pushed or pressed on something during the dismantling process, but it appeared that the intended repair was now unnecessary and the computer had fixed itself. I was reminded of my Tandy 200 laptop that had a very similar problem. It had remained unused for many years and when I powered up booted only to black lines on screen. However, after several days with batteries installed it miraculously came back to life and has been fine ever since. I toyed with the idea of scoping the chips anyway and then I thought, what the hell, it's working, let's put it back together and play instead. With a little bit of wiggling the motherboard can be pressed back into place in the case and then I reinstalled the power supply and battery covers. I power cycled the computer several times and it cheerfully turned on every time. Pressing the on-off button again, the pocket sprang to life. The machine comes with Microsoft's GW Basic burned into the ROM. GW is Microsoft's OEM version of IBM Basic A. I launched GW Basic from the command line and typed in a simple Hello World program which you can see running here. When I acquired the Pocket, the first thing I wanted to do was to transfer some useful software to it. At the time I was heavily into listening to and decoding data modes on shortwave, and my goal was to create a portable and pocketable shortwave decode station using my Sony SW100 shortwave radio and the Pocket. The difficulty of course is that whereas all the necessary signals are available, they appear on a non-standard single expansion port at the rear of the machine. A serial adapter was available but these were pretty rare back in 1998 when my pocket came to me. Examining the pitch of the contacts within the port I realised that they were the same as a dim memory module I happened to have lying around. With a bit of cutting and filing I was able to fashion a kind of plug that connected comfortably to the pocket's expansion port. I soldered a ribbon cable to the relevant pins on the DIM and a DB25 on the other end and it worked perfectly. I've put the pinouts for both connectors up on screen so you can replicate this. 
Please be aware that the Pocket Expansion port is known to be extremely sensitive to static charges, although at the time I didn't know this and I went merrily ahead with my rather crude connector with no problems whatsoever. I hope you've enjoyed this look inside and out of the Pocket PC and I hope to see you all soon in the back room. Thank you for watching and goodbye.